Let's go ahead and call the meeting to order. We're waiting for Joyce or Joyce is trying to join, but we can get started with things since we've got a long agenda for tonight. Uh, first order of business is the consent agenda. Uh, I'm not showing any warrants, um, Jennifer, on my consent agenda. Were those I did not. I didn't receive any warrants this week. Okay, we'll skip that. We have minutes for April 1st, 2020. Mass Redevelopment Real Estate Technical Assistance Grant, uh, Route 9 Business Market Plan, permission to apply for the grant, Melanson Inc. FY 2020, close out accounting, accounting contract, select board ratifies, Melanson Inc. FY 2021, accounting contract, select board ratifies, routine electrical IFB award, amp electric, plumbing and gas IFB award, Richard Watling. Appointments for FY 2021 Police, Fire, uh, Boards, and Committees, Council on Aging Appointment, Linda LaDuke, and Veterans uh, Services Intermunicipal Agreement, City of Northampton, the Select Board will sign. I move we accept. And a second, please. Second, second. All right. I, oh, I just wanted to take out the uh, additional appointments. Good. Okay, we'll take that out. And then uh, anything else? What's up? What's in? Hi. Hey, Joyce. Hey, Joyce. We're Hi. just doing this consent agenda. We pulled out the additional appointments. Sounds like you got bombs going off at your house. <laughs> no, that's cruiser going by my house. Oh, there you go. Okay. There's a, tr there's a tree down across Rocky Hill and knocked out a bunch of power lines. So that's what you guys are hearing. Oh, hi, Mitch. Yeah. He's going the wrong way. He just went by my house the other way. <laughs> <laughs> redirect. Redirect. Don't say that. So, uh, all right. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 The only thing I wanted is uh, the financial management team. Mm -hmm. I asked David if uh, Nixon, if I could be a member of that team as the town hall liaison. And so I just wanted to be added to that list. That was all. That, that would be fine. The more the merrier. Okay. All right. So could I get a motion to approve that list? Adding Christian, please. So moved. I can okay. All right. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. So moving on, uh, public comments will limit it to, is it three minutes a piece? And uh, if you would like to make public comments, please wave or make yourself known on the video here so we can. hearing and make a determination and so that we could relay those uh, so we could relay any findings to the city of Worcester. Uh, additionally, this, uh, this family and this dog, uh, we believe that they have actually moved to and from Hadley uh, on two separate occasions. So there's also the possibility that they may move back in the future, at which point we, uh, you as the select board will have already taken appropriate action to, to, determine the dog dangerous if you so if you see fit okay and uh mr dutrois could you identify yourself and give your uh recollection of the incident please uh sure i'm cobus or cornelius dutrois i go by cobus um yeah so i wasn't home at the time of the attack um my wife was in the backyard swimming with the two boys and then um the this was not the first time that we asked the owners to fix they were renters and we asked multiple times to have the fence fixed uh, which did not happen um, the dog luckily the, the the prior times none of our animals were in the backyard um, but this time my wife was swimming with the two boys outside 
Eli, the um, diamond came into the backyard and then, um, yep, I guess, tried to protect uh, my wife. And then, um, yep, a big fight ensued where my wife tried to separate the two animals, um, got bitten on her thumb, um, and Eli had, um, yeah, a few puncture wounds in his neck um, and was tossed around a little bit. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, Lieutenant Cook, do you have any questions for Mr. Dutrois? Uh, I don't have any questions for Mr. Dutrois. I would just say that um, that if Mrs. Dutrois is available to give her version, then we could enter in into this hearing direct testimony. Uh, you know, Mr. Dutrois, while you know, I certainly appreciate your your uh, statement on this. Unfortunately, we're dealing with an issue of hearsay. Sure. Um, let me see if she's home yet. She was. Yes. Oh, um, she literally just parked, so she can be here in thirty seconds if you need her. Oh, to. perfect. <laughs> All right, so we'll uh, hang on a second and uh, put her under oath as well. Joyce, you have something? Yeah, to unmute. I just had had a question, and that maybe will that come after her testimony? Yeah, you can you can ask all your questions as soon as she uh, has a chance. Hello, Hello, Mrs. Uh, Dutois. We just need to go ahead and. Uh, uh, have you sworn in? So if you could raise your right hand and uh, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony to be given in this matter will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Okay, great. Could you um, tell us your versions, uh, uh, your your recollection of the incident that happened with the dog? Um, so my, I was at the swimming pool with my friend. Uh, my friend had two kids and I had my little boy, my four-year-old. Um, we were sitting at the swimming pool. Um, my two dogs were in the yard, um, my Labrador Retriever and my Shiba Inu. Um, and then our neighbor's dog, um, like he's done many times before, um, came underneath their fence um, into our yard. Um, and then our dogs tried to protect us. And so um, I kind of came in between the dogs. But um, So their dog grabbed my Shiba Inu by the neck. Um, and so I tried to get them apart. At some point I did. Um, but then the dog bit my thumb, and in the process, I left the dog, and then the dog um, grabbed my dog again on the neck and started dragging him. So I was just screaming and going kind of crazy. Um, but so, and, and um, one of the sons of our neighbors did get into our yard as well, but he didn't really do anything. Um, I think that he was scared too because he's, um, I don't know, I guess he's middle, middle school age. Um, so he was just kind of standing there. Um, and then by the time that it, at some point the dog did let go and then, um, you know, we just, it, it happened so fast, it, not fast, but it felt like, um, I'm not quite sure how the dog let go in the end, um, but he did. And so, and then the, the dad was in the yard and he apologized, um, you know, and he, he told us, well, we're going to move in a week anyway. Um, because I did say, you know, we've been asked, we've asked many, many times to get the, the fence fixed. Um, because it's happened before the dog has jumped on my four-year-old, the dog has jumped on me and ripped my pants before. And every time we have to take him out, um, and get them back to their yard. Um, but this is the first time and, and thank goodness the last time that it got aggressive and where it, he did attack our dog and our dog's neck did bleed quite a lot. Um, my thumb's okay, but, um, it's just not something that we wanted to happen again, especially because we have two little kids, um, where we live. And, um, at that point we had friends over, so I'm just glad it wasn't a kid. But that's pretty much what happened. Lieutenant Cook, do you have any questions for Mrs. Dutrois? I do not. Okay. Do you uh, know of anyone else that may have information regarding this matter? Uh, me? Uh, Lieutenant Cook. No, I do not. Okay. I have I have some questions. Okay. Go ahead, Joyce. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Okay. Um, one of my questions is, I have a, a, a few. 
Um, has the dog ever been aggressive any other time that it has come into the yard besides maybe jumping on a child or being friendly? Um, was it aggressive when it jumped on the child or was it just being playful at that time? I think it was just being playful. Um, the dog, you know, was a, pu a puppy when they got them and um, he's, he just got bigger, but still puppy energy. And so I think it was just a puppy energy jumping on my son at one time and jumping on me. Um, the, the only time that I can say it was aggressive was this last time where he really to, you know, bit my dog twice and did mm -hmm. not want to let go. Um, so that's the only time that I was really scared. The other times, you know, it was that playful puppy energy, but it's a strong, big dog. So I just didn't want that to happen to my kids. Certainly. And I can understand that, but I'm looking to see, did he actually attack you or were, was he, was it all in the, uh, process of you trying to get the dogs apart that you got bit? It wasn't yeah. that he actually attacked you. You were just trying to separate the dogs. And yeah. that occurred, right? Yeah, I wouldn't say he attacked me. Um, I would just say that, yeah, I got bit in the process of trying to get him off my dog. Okay. I would say he did attack my dog though, um, two times. And that was really scary because he wrapped yeah. by his neck. Um, yeah. And that was very traumatic for myself and my kids. Yeah. Um, but no, he did not attack me personally, um, except for my thumb that got bit in the way of trying to get him off my dog. Okay. So then also you had a third dog in the yard, a Labrador. Yeah. Did anything, did he intervene? Did he get excited? Did he, you know, like want to join the melee that was happening? Did, did, or did she's he just. Yeah. She's an older, an older dog. So she was there. She barked. She was around my feet. Um, uh -huh. But it was between the two smaller, you know, they're both kind of the same size. So Shiba Inu and the neighbor's dog. Um, okay. And there, and I, I, and it was two males. I don't know if that has something to do with it. Um, but those two dogs just kind of, or at least the dogs, um, you know, drag Eli. Um, yeah. But Molly, no, um, she didn't. She was, she was there, and she was barking, but she did not get bit. She didn't bite back. She's just a very mellow old dog. Um, yeah. Well, luckily, luckily, she didn't get involved with it, so that's a good yeah. thing. Yeah. 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 So I was just trying to piece it together that the dog is not actually aggressive, except at this time when your younger dog stepped in, even though the diamond had gone over to like see the kids in the pool, he wasn't actually being aggressive towards anybody at that point until the dog <laughs> stepped in, correct? Yeah. Yeah. I, I wouldn't say that if my dogs were not in the yard, um, you know, they, he might've jumped on us. You know, I don't think he would have yeah. attacked us. No, okay. you're right. Okay. So it's not normally that diamond was an aggressive dog. He just was, uh, like you say, I think maybe when two males are together, they don't like each other. Male and females get along fairly better than two, two males. Um, cause I, my daughter has a male and she liked, and he likes females better than males. Well, that's okay. Um, but anyway, um, so I'm just trying to, you know, decipher things out as, as if, as if this has been a habit. We've had a few dog hearings, um, over the years that I have been on the board and usually the other dogs are extremely aggressive, um, mm -hmm. towards any animal that goes by them. It doesn't make it or a person. So I'm just trying to decipher all of, of, of what happened to you. And I'm, I'm sorry that it happened to your dog. And certainly we don't want you know, that to happen again, but, uh, you know, it may have just been one instance where that happened. And I, again, I wouldn't want that to happen again. So I'm not making light of it for sure. I'm just trying to gather all the facts on whether or not, you know, this is a uh, aggressive dog or not. Yeah. No, I understand. Anybody Can I just, uh, sorry, go ahead. So, uh, I can, I can probably, uh, I can, probably add a little bit to this. Um, I just, so with regards to following our investigation, um, this is not a situation where we are going to be seeking euthanasia. Um, this is a situation where, you know, we don't really have a whole lot of, uh, of history with this dog. Um, but based on the fact that there, um, there was this dog fight and also through, uh, ACO dragons, uh, investigation, we also found that the dog owner, um, 
never supplied any proof of dog license, any proof of rabies vaccination. Um, it just did not give us any feelings that uh, the dog owner was, was that of a responsible dog owner. So we felt as though this was the best course of action. And I think that if I just uh, really quickly uh, let everyone know that what we are suggesting, if you deem the dog dangerous, what we would be suggesting would be, um, uh, I'm not going to read the entirety of each section, but we're, we're suggesting uh, restraint. Um, we're suggesting confinement. We're suggesting uh, supplemental, uh, a requirement of supplemental insurance when we're, we're, we're requesting muzzling when off property. Uh, and we're requesting that the owner of the dog, um, you know, maintain the appropriate licenses and, uh, and, provide that inf and provide that information to animal control. And I can, uh, following this hearing, I can send you uh, via email what exactly the, uh, the, the phrasing is in the, in the MGL. So did we check with Jessica to see if the dog was registered or not? The dog is not. Okay, so that's number one. The dog was not registered in town. How long had the dog lived in town? I couldn't answer that for you, Joyce. Okay. About two and a half years, at least, that we know of. Okay, thank you. I, was a puppy, but yeah. Okay, thank you. That's good to know. They did not register in two and a half years, so thank you. Christian, you had something? I had. I was just going to ask. It sounds like the house is empty now. Has the fence been mended at all, or is the landlord even addressing that? Because that sounds like that might be a kind of the source of the problem as well. Is that if that fence has been left undone? You've got a dog that likes to roam um, and nothing to really contain it solidly. Yeah. So I don't know if there's yeah. anything we can do with that. But um, that was my concern. And, and thank you, uh, Lieutenant, for explaining the dangerous dog because I wanted to know what exactly we were talking about. So thanks. I figured that might save some questions. So does anybody else have anything to add or any further questions for uh, Mrs. Detroit or uh, Lieutenant Cook? Does anybody yes. contact the landlord to see if they could fix that fence? Because the next person that comes in with a dog, they crawl through the same hole. We would love to know that too. I, we don't have her um, her number or a way to contact her. Um, it would be great. I would love to have her information to ask her. Um, it's a really long thing. And if you have a dog that's going to dig, um, you know that yeah. Um, so she would she yeah. would be on her, she would be on our tax record, so you could yeah. find that out. Yeah, I don't think that would be your your problem. I think it would be the police department's problem to get a hold of the property owner. Four hours. They have been fixing up the um, house the entire week, I guess, for the new renter. So maybe, maybe the fence is on the docket to still get fixed. <laughs> okay. Well, we certainly well, can, we certainly know who owns the house, and that we can look into it. How old do you think the puppy was or is? Around two years, I would say. They they've been there about two three years in the house, and um, they got him as a puppy, um, you know, around that time. So I would say around two years. Uh, I have one question for Lieutenant Cook. Are we able to pass uh, that resolution deeming him a dangerous dog without the muzzle requirement for being off property? Can we remove that if we want? We certainly can. Those are, would just be our suggestions and you as the select board can adopt as a uh, few of those suggestions down to one. If you deem the dog dangerous, then you'd be required by law to adopt at least one of those. Because the others, the others sound pretty reasonable to me. The muzzle off property, I mean, it's, it sounds like the reason he got into this was because he chose to chase after another dog, but if he was restrained, that wouldn't have been an issue, so. Correct. And if in, in reading the report, you know, of what the owners had said that the dog was, has never been aggressive towards anybody else um you know that holds pretty well that he's not an aggressive dog he got into a confrontation with another dog which sometimes that happens um not necessarily meaning that he hasn't really ever attacked uh on a person an aggressive in a an angry attack on a person so you have to take that into consideration also 
Um, certainly we don't want dogs attacking people aggressively, but if they're being playful, that's different. Um, so uh, I'm not sure it's kind of a moot type of thing when we're holding a hearing and we're not able to have the uh, other person or persons involved in this hearing at the hearing and we're, we're going to uh, make a determination without both parties being present. Uh, I think it's kind of a moot area at this point that the, you know, the dog does not live here any longer in town. Uh, if you want to go on record um, as saying as if they move into town, which we'll never know if they rent, uh, and an issue comes up, we can certainly have documentation on this dog. But I'm not exactly sure that having it issued an aggressive dog at this point without the other party being present, that that's not uh, uh, legal, um, in my opinion. I think that your assessment of the situation is correct. I think that this was a dog. This was a, a fight between two dogs, and uh, I think you're 100 percent correct. This isn't a situation like what we've dealt with in the past, where we've had serious injuries as a result of dog bites. Um, mm -hmm. In this situation, though, you know, regardless, the um, the owner of the dog does have a right of appeal within the courts. So, you know, your, your um, determination of dangerous and anything imposed is not the end-all be-all. So um, I know that ACO Dragon did make attempts to reach out to the fam to reach out um, to the Torres family uh, to get them on this meeting. Uh, he did speak with a family member and did pass along that we were having this hearing. And uh, he, why they're not here, I can't say for sure. Um, you know, this is a situation where we had a dog bite, um, and we, as, as animal control officers, when we deal with these kinds of things, we want to make sure that we are not putting the town in a position of liability by not moving this forward to a vicious dog hearing. Uh, you know, if there were a, a serious bite in the future, we... Uh, we want to prevent that. We want to prevent that from happening. So that's, that's what our position is on this. And Lieutenant, you said that this family has moved in and out several times. We understand that this may be their second time living in Hadley. Okay. I was my, just... Go ahead, Mitch. They're li my understanding is, is that they're living in Worcester at this time. My inclination in something like this is to deem the dog dangerous but with a minimal um level i think the like uh the chairman was saying about having a restraint be the action item so to speak is good because that does get us the cover of having the dog restrained deeming it dangerous putting it on the radar but it's not something so severe where we're muzzling it we're caging it we're doing those types of things because it's always tricky with this. It could have been a one-off where two dogs were playing and it got carried away, or it could be a path toward a child or something like that, getting, getting more severe, severely bitten. And I know we would all hate for that to happen. So um, I'd be happy to entertain a motion with that dangerous dog. Um, and Mitch maybe can help me with the wording as far as restraint or um, whatnot goes. Yeah, so uh, you have uh, uh, ACO Dragon sent me a number of the terms in which he suggested, and um, I would uh, I would say that what we've experienced in the past with other dog owners with with a documented dog bite, they're not able to get that insurance anyway. Um, so I would say that there's no real point in trying to impose that. Uh, but I would say that. Um, section one which is humanely restrained uh within their yard section two uh confined the premises so if, if they return to the town of hadley they would have to have a, a appropriate appropriate fencing to keep the dog confined uh 
Chairman Phil uh, wanted to take off the muzzling off property. So that would, uh, and then the only thing left at that point would be uh, proof of licensing and rabies vaccination um, if they return to the town of Hadley. Yeah, I would say without a doubt, the proof of licensing and rabies vaccination should be included. And I mean, personally, I think the restraint is enough. I don't know if the, you know, um, what you were saying about the, the backyard being uh, contained to the backyard only. Um, yeah. That seems restrictive and maybe costly, but, you know, restraint is fixing the fence and making sure the dog can't get out as well. So. Well, the that dog's not the dog's not living at the place where the fence I, needs to be fixed anymore. So yeah, yeah. So that's but kind, in the of, future, a, they that's kind of a move thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that your motion, Christian? Then that is my motion. All right. Can I get a second? Well, I got one more question. Was there any medical? Did she go to doctors or the hospital or anything to get her hand checked out? Just in favor. Yeah, second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Abstain. John, were you a yes or no? I didn't hear it. Oh, yeah, I. Can you hear okay. me? Yep, I can hear you now. All right, so. With number, with them not being present, I would say that having uh, doing the verbal notification of the right to appeal is is not necessary, and I would follow up with them in writing, uh, notifying them of their right to appeal. All right. Well, just in case they're watching, I'll just read it just, just so that we're, way we're covered. Uh, the Torreses have the right to appeal the board's de decision to the district court in the Eastern Hampshire District Court in Belchertown within ten days of this order being issued. And that concludes our dangerous dog hearing. So to the uh, Dutois, thank you for spending some time with us this evening. And, and uh, Lieutenant Cook, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Have a good night. All right. So we'll go ahead and uh, move on to the next item, which is uh, Route 9 widening project, town property land takings. And it looks like we have a representative from MassDOT here. Is uh, Mr. Christensen? Is that right? You're, I think you're muted. You better mute me pretty quick. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Better. It, it, is it uh, Mr. Christensen? Is that what it says on the screen there? Yes. yes. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. All right, so um, explain what's happening here and uh, what the request is from MassDOT. Uh, oh, the request is for land damage agreements and uh, right of entry for small takings on town property. And it's basically takings for to uh, improve the sidewalks and uh, Pretty much it. There's a temporary easement just so we can step on your property. Okay. Um, part of the reason that we wanted you to be present this evening uh, before we took any action on this item was um, we've got an ongoing issue with a clearing of sidewalks on Route 9 that's been going on forever. And uh, a year or so ago, I'm sure David Nixon can give the date better, but um, a rep from MassDOT in a public hearing uh, basically promised to take care of the sidewalks uh, along Route 9 that are in the state layout, and uh, that never materialized. Um, every winter, they snow blow the bridge and stop at Cross Path Road and then don't touch anything else along the entirety of Route 9. And I can tell you that the town doesn't want uh, the responsibility of clearing those sidewalks, nor do we sh feel that we should have to especially the way sidewalks were installed with telephone poles and utility boxes and things like that right in the middle of the areas. So um, we want, you know, in order to, for us to cooperate and, and, and help you guys out, we need you to follow through and do what was promised to the town of Hadley. And I'm sure David Nixon maybe can add a little bit more. Yeah. Sure. 
So uh, we have uh, looked at the issue of uh, developing a local bylaw for um, um, uh, shifting the burden of snow removal onto property owners rather than the town. Um, that has proved to be problematic. We've been to address this at three town meetings and each time the proposal gets withdrawn before it goes to a vote. And the challenges that we face are that we have a patchwork of commercial and private properties uh, along Route 9 and particularly in the project area that's being suggested from Middle Street to Maple Street. And we also have commercial properties that um, although they, uh, the property of, uh, abuts the, the layout of the sidewalk, the businesses themselves are so far set back, say the Hampshire Mall, for example, um, that they feel that they are being unfairly burdened with the cost of maintaining sidewalks in a, uh, the wintertime that uh, benefit them not at all because people are not walking on those sidewalks in order to uh, patronize those businesses. So this has been an ongoing issue. I've, I've stated very clearly to MassDOT in the past that uh, I regard this as an unfunded land mandate uh, and that MassDOT has agreed that uh, it is and that uh, it uh, is MassDOT's um, uh, responsibility to maintain sidewalks in the town of Hadley that they construct. Uh, well, I'm not aware of any, uh, see, that is, uh, clearing the sidewalks and stuff is, is, is not in my forte. I'm just, uh, the right of agent. I go out and I secure the, uh, easements from the people. I explain the project to them as far as, uh, clearing the sidewalks. If you were promised that by someone else, uh, you know, that's above me. You know, I, I don't, I can't make those decisions. Uh, I, I know the secretary, her mandate is when we do a road over that she wants bike lanes and accessible sidewalks. And this is, you know, her mandate. And this is what we try to uh, carry on. We, we construct the sidewalks. And uh, generally, Mass DOT with the authority to um, uh, to grant our request, get in touch with David Nixon, uh, the town administrator. And, and get this sorted out and work on the public hearings and getting all the departments on the same page and make sure that we have accurate and current plans to work from. Did he drop off? He must have got pissed off. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe my questions were too hard for him. I think so. He always has that effect on people. It's okay. <laughs> may, I, may I just uh, tell you one thing, if you don't mind? Uh, this was the first gentleman we met with at the bank. And he's the one that told us it would only be three lanes. It was the project manager. In the, he sent me to the design uh, person that's in charge of the design and to Boston to meet with the project manager. It was them that they contradicted what this gentleman had said. So they're not on the same page themselves. I'm shocked. <laughs> so I've heard from, from one of our um, businesses, um, Sunrise Printing, that their land taking will take all of his parking because they're going to have a bus stop that goes set back from the road. Does the town have any capability of stopping the state? One of the things that we have is the 100% complete plans. They're available down at DPW. 
Um, it might be worth our while to uh, go through these with these uh, business and neighborhood complaints uh, in mind and just see where the new bus stops are located, how much land is going to be taken, uh, where the sidewalk is going to be deployed. Uh, we should have final plans in, in, in Chris Okafor's office. As far as I know, though, those plans are not the, the current plans. I mean, they, no. they show. Those uh, are only 50% plans. They still got the three lanes on the drawings on E Street. I checked two weeks ago when we left the meeting. The next morning, I went in the office and took a look at them, and they still have three lanes on them on E Street. I talked to the project uh, engineer and uh, GPI, uh, and they assured me that the 100% plans have been completed. Uh, if we don't have a set of them, then we... Oh, sorry. John, John, were you, uh, were you exaggerating about the five lanes on East Street, or is there a set oh, of lanes out there no, that this, shows five lanes? What, no, they want to put five mm -hmm. lanes coming out of northbound of East Street and southbound on East Street. There'll be five lanes total and so, the north side of Route 9, the south side of Route 9. So when you come out of the drive through of the bank, you'll be on the road, basically. Much. The, the wooden stakes on their lawn by their sign, Yeah. Where the sidewalks are going to be all the way up yeah. by that sign. It's terrible. I, you know, I went through, I went to a couple of meetings where they were showing us all the plans and, and I, I've never seen anything like that. Um, so we really definitely need to get a hold of whatever's out there, you know, whatever's the most accurate because that's. Well, just like Amy said, this guy told her it was three lanes and the engineer that came out told her it was five lanes. So yeah, they, well, I, all, yeah. they need to make up their mind before they even present us with it. Yeah. I mean, I talked to, I was talking to Amy about it and um, you know, seen some of the pictures that I think that gentleman was giving to Amy in the bank. And um, it had three lanes on it, and now they want to add two more. I just don't even know where they would where they would put that. So it's definitely something that we need to get a hold of. And then we got the issue of uh, drawings. that DPW has three lanes, and the engineer GPI, they are, cons they are consulting engineers, also confirmed the three lanes. So I'm just hearing I'm hearing the five lane lanes for the first time and i think the chairman is correct if they have it seems as if they are not coordinated yet so and um, they we might need to revisit this again maybe get in touch with the their project engineer their the gpi and gpi has been very friendly and very cooperative with us when we we've been communicating with them properly so i don't know where these five lanes are coming from but I will uh, try to get in touch with GPI tomorrow. Um, so the plans that are on that desk, Chris, are correct. Then three lanes. Yes, that is the correct. That's the that's the that's the one we have. That's the, uh, the GPI who is their consultant. Uh, that is where the hundred percent. Except they say new drawings, but they have not presented that to us. So it looks like Mr. Christensen is back with us now. Um, okay, sorry about that. I have some communication problems here. Okay. Uh, um, so what I was asking is if we could uh, have you or somebody else from MassDAT get in touch with David Nixon, and let's all get on the same page here and um, mm -hmm. make sure everyone's got the right information. And we also need to get the public hearings done that haven't been done yet. Um, uh, they were held, though, uh, a year ago I last fall. You weren't aware of those meetings? They've had several. Mm. Amy Fighton, you're a Chamber of Commerce person, I believe, and a, a business uh, manager here in town. So what are your... Hi, hi, Eric. I uh, We spoke earlier um, when you... Oh, yes. yes. Yes, for the bank, yes. So you know for a lot bank, of my yeah. concerns, right? And I was told, I mm -hmm. told you as a property owner, as a representative of Bank ESB, we have not been notified until um, recently when you had come out. You were really the first person I talked to. So the notification wasn't there. Last year, the only reason why I knew about anything that was happening was because I'm a member of the Chamber of Commerce. 
And um, so they had a meeting, but not all businesses are members of the Amherst Chamber. So I feel that a lot of people did not know about the meeting. So I did attend part of it and was waiting to hear more. So I've only attended one. And I just wanted to let you know, after we spoke, you had told me to talk to um, Doug White from Design, which I did. And he came out with the member from GPI, which is John Tamburini, who is a project manager. They're the ones that told us that there's five lanes going in. So they gave us pictures. They said the information that we had was not up to date, that they had more up to date stuff and we were not, we do not have it. And they told me that there is five lanes going into East Street. So that came from John Tamburini from GPI. Just wanted okay. to let you know that. Sure. Okay. Right. It sounds to me like the hearing was, it sounds to me like the hearing was for chamber members and none of the townspeople of Hadley were included or notified. There were public hearings, 25% uh, complete uh, plans and 75% complete plans, uh, but we definitely need a stakeholder meeting in order to refresh everybody's memory as to uh, how this project is going to unfold. There are a lot of logistics that we need to be thinking through. The impact upon our neighboring communities, particularly the University of Massachusetts, um, the, the traffic congestion that is likely to be part of it. But we also are participating in a, um, in a partnership with MassDOT to, uh, at the same time as they're repairing the road, we're going to be replacing 100-year-old sewer pipes and water pipes at a discount. So, you know, we want to be a partner with, with MassDOT, um, but we haven't had any, com you know, com uh, focused communication for a long time. And I think we need to have another stakeholder meeting, even if it's not required by law. And, uh, Mr. Dwyer had something. So I have been going to the stakeholder meetings and that group has been functionally disbanded, but um, we definitely had the 25% hearing. I don't recall that we had a subsequent hearing per se. Um, so I'm not sure where we are on the, on the hearing schedule. And I, I'll add, I'm a member of the planning board, so that's why I've been involved in this. Okay, so uh, Mr. Christensen, if you could have some of Mass DOT get with David and we could all get on the same page and make sure this is, uh, we open up some lines of communication here before we uh, proceed. Absolutely, I will, uh, I will contact uh, the district highway director in D2, because I work out at D1, but I can contact him, it's uh, Peter Kavicki. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as the stakeholder meetings, I was under the impression they had several before the 25% hearing, because I know I attended that one. And I think Amy was at that one, the, the Chamber of Commerce was held after the 25%, which I also attended. And um, again, it's uh, actually I had hired a, design, uh, a consultant firm to go out and reach out to the, to the people, the, the stakeholders. That's why I'm a, a bit surprised to hear that uh, nobody was contacted. I'm a little dismayed. I mean, I could probably go back in the records and get an attendance sheet. But, uh, you know, the, the people I, I personally been out there and interviewed about 45 of the businesses and houses. And for the most part, they're pretty receptive of this uh, because there's no there's no sidewalks there now. So okay. I'm just a little bit surprised at the, the response. That's all. Okay. Well, let's try to see if we can straighten it out. And uh, also, we'd like a resolution on the sidewalk. So I'm not sure if the same person at uh, District 2 can take care of that for us or not. But uh, if you could check on that, that'd be great. Absolutely. I'll, uh, I'll be in contact with David uh, probably tomorrow to see, see what I can get set up. Okay. Thank you, sir. I appreciate the time. Okay. <laughs> So moving on, next item is uh, sustainability committee proposal, green community designation. 
the sustainability committee will meet with the select board to propose that the town of Hadley formally enter the Massachusetts Green Communities Program as administered by the Department of Energy Resources. So, uh, Christian, do you want to start off or? Uh... Sure, yeah, I, I just will yep. give the caveat that, uh, you know, this is just an introduction to green communities. We have a little bit of time and I can just pass it over to Jack. He's the chair of the Climate Change Committee and see if he has anything to say before uh, Mark Rubinsky from Green Communities says a little something. Yep. Massachusetts has 351 cities and towns and 271 cities and towns are already green communities. A am I able to share my screen, David? Mm -hmm. All right. Yes. Uh, let me see about that. All right. So hold on. Yep, there you go. All right, great. So here's the map just to give a sense of the other communities in Mass in um, Hampshire County, with the exception of South Hadley and Hadley, are all designated green communities. And I, I believe that there's a reason why that they've bought in. Um, Mark Rubinsky, in just a moment, he'll tell you a little bit more about the designation fee that we would receive if we become part of this. There's five criteria that we have to meet, and it's probably too late in this year for us to put in an application, but this is something that the Energy Committee, the Climate Change Committee in town, we hope that uh, the leaders in Hadley pursue. So Mark, I'll pass it over to you. Mark is from Mass, D-O-E-R, Mass Department of Energy Resource. And uh, he has some information to share with all of you. Good evening, everyone. Um, can I share my screen as well? Yeah, sure. Can you see that presentation? Yes. Is it still working? Yes. So I'm the Western Regional Coordinator for Green Communities. Um, I'm a Western Mass native and I, I live in Amherst, so I'm very familiar with, with Hadley. Um, uh, as, as Jack had mentioned, 271 of the 351 um, communities in Massachusetts are green communities and 18 of our of the, the 20 communities in Hampshire County are green communities with only Hadley and, and South Hadley um, uh, missing out on that. Um, these are the, the green communities that we have so far. We have 271. We welcomed in 31 more green communities uh, last year, um, and we're expecting a pretty similar number this year, too. Um, as part of the Green Communities Program, we're, we are um, authorized to provide up to $20 million per year in funding to our green communities. And the source of these funds comes from REGI, which is the Regional Greenhouse, and alternative, alternative compliance payments that the utilities pay. Um, so the, the, the big benefit of, of becoming a green community is, is obviously the, the grants and funding that you could have access to. Um, the first part, the first kind of uh, benefit that, that Jack had mentioned is the designation grant. So once a community becomes a green community, um, all communities get the base amount of $125,000, and then they receive an adder on top of that based on the community's population and their, their per capita income. So using last year's numbers, Hadley is estimated to receive around $130,000 if they became a green community. And these can be used for um, on energy uh, related projects. Um, the, and once that is, is finished out, once the designation um, grant has been spent down and the community is still in good standing, um, they can apply for competitive grants, which are up to $200,000 um, per, which can be up to $200,000 per applicant, per green community that they can apply for. Um, and that's, if, that's as long as they're um, still in good standing, which means they're completing their annual report every year and all of their criteria are still in place. And the annual report is kind of like the, kind of like the green community's tax return that's done every year, just so we can keep um, 
we can keep abreast of, of what the community's done and how they're making progress on their goals. So taking a look at, um, at your neighbors, a little, little look at the, the neighborhood around you, um, most of the, all of the towns around you, aside from South Hadley, um, are green communities. And these are the, the total funding that over the history of green communities program, we've given um, the towns surrounding you. So this includes their $125,000 adder, plus the adder um, and, and any competitive grants that these communities have, have gone for um, over the years. And we expect these numbers to, to only continue to rise. Um, South Hadley, you'll see, is in a, a little bit different of a color because they've actually um, completed uh, the, they've, they've adopted the stretch code, which is part of becoming a green community is adopting the stretch code. So um, we're hoping that they'll come in either this year or next year um, to become a green community as well. So those are the benefits. The benefits are obviously the, the funding. Um, uh, what about the, what do you have to do to become a green community? And there's, there's five criteria that a, a community has to complete in order to become a green community. Um, and I'll try and go through those right now a little bit quickly. Some of them need a little bit more, more time than others and are a little bit more complex than others. So um, if, if we are interested, I'd, I'd really like to have some follow-ups with either the select board or certain committees to talk about some of these criteria. The first criteria, and the criteria one and two really go together. Um, it's as of right siting for renewable energy. Um, and that can be renewable energy um, generation facilities. It can be as of right siting for research and development facilities um, uh, or manufacturing facilities as well. So it has to be one of those the community has to choose. I know Hadley already has a lot of um, a lot of renewable energy on the ground, so they've already des designated large locations to um, generating facilities. So some of the ways that can be that can go about doing that is just designating um, certain zoning districts within your zoning, or even doing an overlay district in order to qualify. For, um, for this criteria. And then criteria number two, which goes along with this is expedited permitting. And the, the expedited permitting um, is saying that um, these, these siting can't take more than a year. Um, my predecessor used to say that only Boston would joke that expedited permitting is a year. So most, most communities don't have an issue meeting this, these guidelines, uh, meeting the expedited permitting part. Um, but you're, we might want to look at your zoning in order to modify that a little bit if it doesn't already need it. Criteria number three, which is some of us call it the, the term paper part of the Green Communities Program. It's really looking at the, um, all of your municipal buildings, schools, your vehicles, your, um, your street lights, your pumping stations, wastewater treatment, um, any any facility or, or, or anything that the, the utility owns that they're using energy on, we want to create a baseline of that right now. We want to keep track of how much energy um, Hadley is using in order to develop. And then we all simultaneously will develop a plan to reduce that energy by 20% over the next five years. Um, now, this is just a plan. You, you, you're not held to it. If you don't meet that 20%, percent we're not going to come and take all your funds away um, so but this is just us creating a, a baseline of that we have tools to help you do it um, and then there's an annual report where we we keep track of of how much energy you're using as well um, we have an online system to um, to upload it we work with the utilities to automatically get some of that data um, the online system you would just have to update with delivered fuels like oil propane um, gasoline, diesel, things like that. Um, and then we, we work with you in order to, to calculate that um, and then try and follow that plan as we're going along. And that usually also starts with identifying how you're going to reduce the energy, which starts with an energy audit too. So criteria number four, which is uh, a fuel efficient vehicle policy. And so as a community, you're saying that you're only going to purchase fuel efficient vehicles 
for the municipality. Um, uh, police cruisers and other emergency vehicles like, like fire trucks are exempt from this policy until they're commercially available. We're starting to see some, some police cruisers and, and hybrids come out um, that are be beginning to be commercially available. Um, we haven't mandated that right now, but we're, we're gonna see how they work with some other towns. Uh, and then also any vehicles that are over 8,500 pounds, so some of the larger vehicles are also exempt from this, um, this policy. Uh, and we, this is probably one of the more, more lenient policies in, in, in my opinion is that we, we really make sure that if we're telling you that you have to purchase a vehicle that gets a certain miles per gallon, we're making sure that something's available out there that can get that miles per gallon to, to fit that class of vehicle. So um, other communities haven't had problems meeting this and there's, there's usually, they're almost always something commercially available to fit the town's needs. We just want you to buy the most fuel efficient one possible that's out there. And then the last one, the last criteria is um, to minimize life cycle costs in new buildings. And what this means is that um, any new, new buildings built within the town, um, not just municipality, but, but new, um, new homes as well, have to meet um, a certain criteria. And the way that towns can meet this criteria is by adopting what's known as the stretch energy code. So in Massachusetts, we have two energy codes. We have the base code, and then we have the stretch energy code. And this could be an entire hour long, and it has been an hour or two hour long presentation on its own. So I'm, I'm not gonna get too deep into the stretch energy code. Um, uh, I, think, I think we're up to about 283 of the, the towns and cities in Massachusetts have adopted the stretch energy code. So this isn't, uh, it's not a stretch, as we say, it's not as much of a stretch anymore. Um, and, and it has been, been accomplished in other, other towns and cities and, and um, without, without issue. So um, I hope to have further conversations with you about the, the stretch code going forward too. Oh, here's, our, here's the adoption of the um, stretch energy code by community in Massachusetts. This is an old, older map, this one's at 271. We just had town meetings recently and we had a lot of other um, towns adopt it. So this one's a, a little bit, this map's a little bit older. Um, that's my really quick version of the, the Green Communities Program. Um, I could take some questions if you have some time. Otherwise, um, the, the next steps would be to talk about adopting the criteria, um, looking at your zoning plans with stretch code that would need to be uh, adopted via, um, via town meeting too. So that would be something that we would want, want on the warrant for town meeting. Um, and then it never hurts to work with your planning committees, finance committees, building inspector, just make sure everybody's comfortable and have all of their, their questions answered before we um, proceed with the next steps. So if anybody has any questions or if Jack, you wanna say anything else, um, I'm here. Um, thanks, Mark. I appreciate you working overtime and doing this presentation and helping us along. Uh, is William DeWire still here? I had put a question in chat. I don't know if he already knows. Does Hadley already have the uh, as of right um, sighting in place? Okay. Uh, we have as of right solar on structures, uh, small scale ground mounted by administrative review, but large scale ground mount by uh, special permit. These would be for large scale, so 250 kilowatts and over. Uh, yeah, I believe, I, I don't have the bylaw in front of me, but uh, yeah, I believe that uh, we're we're looking at really if you're if you're doing your house ground mount or roof mount, it's functionally by right because it's only an administrative review that you are compliant with setbacks and the like. So one potential way to meet that is to just designate certain areas, um, and even if you didn't want to to designate, you could already designate places that have already had the the siting up there and do it like an overlay district if you wanted to, that's one way that, that other towns have, have met that criteria. So there's, there's ways to meet the criteria that aren't, shouldn't be too onerous for Hadley since you already have these large scale um, 
solar facilities in place, but generating facilities. Large-scale ones are all by special permit. Yep, they, they have been. But if you wanted to, um, if if you wanted to put an overlay district on that so that it would be as of right for those areas um, and, and kind of move backwards or any 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 other areas that um, could be looked at going forward too to make it as of right without the special permit. So any one district could be as of right. Correct. Yep. As long as as long as it can fit there, and we already know it has because you already have the facilities in place. Well, we have them. We we allow them in the agricultural residential district and the industrial district. Um, we um, I suppose we could put them in the industrial district. I'm not sure how much we have left over in available space there. Mm -hmm. But if somebody wanted to you know, take theirs down and then put it back up, you know, it would be as of right at that point and not, and not need a special permit. Theoretically, we could put the industrial district as of right. Yep, and that or, would be, it would have the room, so I think that would meet it too, but we'd wanna look at it. And I know that the select board has limited time tonight, but this meeting today was all about planting a seed. Uh, I think it's important at so many different levels. First of all, there's the money. Um, I do believe that Hadley probably could use $130,000 from the designation fee and the ability to apply for our piece of those $20 million in annual grants related to energy. Um, I don't think we should let that go to the other 77% of cities and towns in Massachusetts. Uh, I do believe that the um, Climate Change Committee could also help with some of the reporting aspects. So moving forward, we could work on the energy plan and some of the other things that we would have to turn in on an annual basis in order to comply with this. Um, certainly it's something for the select board to discuss and for our town to consider. I had a little bit of ne negativity coming into this meeting tonight, uh, not really knowing what was going to be required of the town of Hadley. Um, so a lot of this information has been very helpful, uh, knowing that we don't have to change over all of our vehicles right now or do any of that such, such stuff that uh, would cost the town a lot of money at this point. But certainly the exempt things of what we have already, um, you know, and what what else could be beneficial to us, I, I will really take this under consideration. Thank you. Good. Thanks, Thank you. Joyce. And, you know, remember what Mark said, that 20% energy reduction, it's a goal. Mm -hmm. It's not mm -hmm. a mandate. You know, okay. we want to move forward to reducing our energy. Um, I spend my summer helping my brother on the family farm. And honestly, this year's weather was like no other. As we yeah. spend hundreds, if not thousands of hours moving water and yeah. dealing with ever rising temperatures. And I think this is a chance for Hadley to do its part yeah. um, on this. I know my wife and I have solar panels on our house and we don't pay an electric bill. It's a wonderful thing. And you've, uh, had, and that, I, you've had that for how many years? Uh, we have had that for 16 years now, Joyce. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Remember, one of the first in town to do that. Yeah, and then I can tell you lots of my neighbors on Mount Warner, Meadowbrook, and Woodlawn, they <laughs> have followed suit. Um, but again, this is a conversation that can continue into the future involving mm -hmm. the select board and then involving the whole town. Mm -hmm. it, 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 and if I could leave you with, with one other thing is, is talk to your neighbors, talk to the other towns. And I've put Jack in touch with some of them. and. Um, I think he would could reiterate too that it's been positive reviews for the program that there is some work, you know, it's not, we're not, it's not free, you know, there's some work, there's some reporting, but um, I really think that the benefits outweigh the cost of this program. And it's a, it's a program I'm proud to be part of. Mark. Yeah. Thanks for raising that because I will tell you speaking with Wayne Fiden in Northampton, speaking with Stephanie in Amherst, and speaking with Carol Collins and Greenfield, they're all energy and sustainability managers. Those communities are large enough to have full-time people in place to help with this. Um, they've all said that it's a no-brainer um, with the monies that they've been able to bring into town. And then I'm um, speaking with Jennifer um, Gannett and Casey over in Deerfield, a more similar community. They said that really it's been very positive for their towns. Mm -hmm. I think there's a reason that so many communities are part of this program. 
So David, what are the next steps that as a select board we would have to take? David Nixon? Either one of you. Um, well, it sounds like you have two town meeting votes that you would have to take. The first town meeting vote would be to adopt the stretch energy code and the other one would be a zoning bylaw that would create the overlay district. So those could go on for town uh, October meeting? October 17th is your next town meeting. On uh, May 6th, 2021 is the annual. So those could go on then? Yep. So we should probably, um, Mark and Jack, maybe um, let's develop a process to at least move in that direction slowly and uh, maybe get with uh, our building commissioner. Yeah. And just make sure we're all on board with this stretch code. Uh, our house that we built three years ago, we used the stretch code even though it wasn't mandatory because of some of the incentives. So it's not a huge deal, but it does add a little bit of cost to can. Um, although that's probably offset by the incentives. But um, so let's just make sure that we're all on the same page and we can do this incrementally and, and uh, way. Good, oh, thanks. Good. Yep. Thank you, uh, Jack, for doing what all that you've done. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. Okay. Thank you both. Thank you all. I appreciate it. Appreciate your time. Thanks, Jack and Mark. Okay. So we'll move on. Actually, I'm going to jump ahead. Um, let's talk about the town administrator transition since Carolyn is here and she might have other things that she needs to do. So, um, or maybe not, but um, I'll just say that uh, Jane and myself have been busy uh, working to get a contract uh, taken care of with uh, Ms. Brennan. And we today ha finally have that in place. So we officially have a new um, town administrator subject to a select board vote, of course, to approve the contract. And uh, so, Carolyn, if you want to kind of introduce yourself, say hello to everybody, and uh, tell us, I, I guess September 15th is, would be your start date, correct? Yes, it would. So, right. yeah, um, thank you. I'm very excited. Um, it's been a goal I've had for about seven or eight years, and I'm just happy to be in this place. I'm happy that. Uh, Hadley is going to be that community that I will become a part of, and I'm really looking forward to uh, working with David, learning more about the community, meeting all of the stakeholders, getting to know all of you, and um, just really being a part of that community, and um, just, uh, again, just so happy that uh, this is where I'm going to start my career as town administrator. Bring your energy. We're looking forward to it. I hope so. I have a lot. <laughs> Most <get> old. <laughs> this will be my third administrator I've hired, so I'm really excited about um, you coming on board. Well, it's, it's, a, it's really a blessing to be able to uh, work with David Nixon and learn from him. You really you couldn't ask for a better situation for me, and I think as well for the town to have that overlap. I'm, I'm happy about that and really looking forward to that. That's great. Thank you. So oh, if I could get a uh, motion to approve uh, the contract so we can get that taken care of um, and then we could, I'm sure Jennifer will have us sign it at some point when she comes around, for, makes her rounds for signatures. So, I make so a motion that we accept Carolyn Brennan as our new town administrator pending final contract approval by legal firms. Second. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Welcome aboard. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations Thank you. indeed. Congratulations. Looking forward to it. Look forward to working with you. Thank it'll, you. It will be fun. It will be. You you have a great teacher. I hired David 15 years ago. So I'm excited that he's going to be able to uh, precept you and introduce you to Hadley and uh, tell you the ways of what to not get into and what to enjoy. So uh, I'm sure that we'll all work well together. I think so. Yes. Thank you. And uh, David Nixon, did you want to talk any more about the transition process while we're on the subject or just leave it for now? Yeah, so um, um, Carolyn has reached out to me. I've sent an email back. Uh, she and I will exchange vital information such as cell phones and 
schedules and so forth. Uh, I've prepared a uh, state of the town first quarter 2021 FY, uh, which uh, should give her a very good picture of where we are right now, and where we hope to be. It's a very challenging time to be a town administrator. So I'm looking forward to working with her and, uh, and uh, doing good uh, things together. Thank you. And I, I think we should also say that she has a great administrative assistant in Jennifer that's uh, always there and very helpful. And um, she also will be a good part of the process too. Right. Well, thanks again, Carolyn, and uh, we'll be seeing you soon. Do we need to do an all, a vote? Did we all say yes? Yes, we did. Okay. I don't know. I'm, I'm so lost tonight <laughs> <laughs> already negotiated the contract or we're going to do that in executive session nope it's all all set uh she's already signed we just need to sign and uh, the attorneys were just given their final uh review and that's okay. it that's great perfect all right so we'll go ahead and move on um to water abatements real quick while uh, Chris is here. So water abatement for 166 Russell Street. Um, Chris, do you want to speak to this or do you want me to talk about it? Yeah, go ahead, Mr. Chairman. Okay. So we have a request uh, for an abatement in the amount of uh, $24,866.22, it looks like. Uh, from Winesick LLC, and looks like a water meter was put in backwards. And so, what's the recommendation from the water department? Uh, Mr. Chairman, we are recommending that uh, the board not approve the abatement. There was nothing wrong with the water with the meters. Uh, the, the calibration was fine. Uh, we tested the meter and we also, uh, all the uh, water went through the meter. Um, the homeowner or the property owner has not given us any reason to think otherwise. Okay. What was all that wording about that it being put in backward? What was that all about? We, I believe Chris is mixing up eight birch meadow with the with the Weinzik property with the backwards meter because there are three abatements tonight. We're, we're talking about Weinzik only right now. Uh, Is that two hundred seven or one sixty six? Uh, one sixty six Russell Street. Oh, okay. I thought you were talking about Butch Middle. No, okay. Go ahead, Jennifer. Turn I, I, I didn't think we were. I didn't think we were on the same page there, Chris. Yes, I was thinking that you were talking about Butch Middle, but uh, you're right. Thanks, Jennifer, for correcting, but bringing that. All right, Chris. So, one sixty-six. What are your? What's the water department's thoughts on that? Mr. Chairman, um, we are still investigating that location. The, the issue of uh, backflow. We we haven't found anything, but we are still investigating. Uh, at this point, I will uh, table that to next meeting. Okay. Uh, and Jennifer has given us some information. We've also got some information from the tax collector, but we are not uh, we are not inclined to recommend anything to the board at this time. All right, so we'll we'll skip one sixty six for now. We'll take this up in the future. Well, I can, I'd like to table it for next week, Mr. Chairman. So okay. we're still doing some investigation. All right, so we'll skip to uh, H Birch Meadow. And this, as soon as it opens, is an abatement for, yeah, hold on. Yeah, the one for number eight, Birch Middle, Mr. Chairman. Um, 461.43, it looks like. Our recommendation is that the board not approve any abatement for eight Birch Middle. Uh, the, mirror, the mirror is functioning very well. We also changed the meter, and then the same complaint is what we are receiving, but we don't have any reason to, the homeowner has not given us any reason to 
think otherwise, or the water went through the meter. Okay, so, so the meter works and uh, the collector's office has verified that the readings were correct. So um, can we get a motion on that one, please? A motion to deny that abatement. Second. Any further discussion? And all those in favor? Aye. Aye. I'm going to abstain from that one. And did Jane say anything? I didn't hear. She's muted. J Jane's muted. Aye. 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 Okay. All right. Okay. So the next one would be uh, 207 Russell Street. And this. Mm -hmm. And if I do have anything to say on that. Go ahead. I'm sorry, David, I didn't mean to cut you off. That rec the 207 Russell Street comes from the collector's office. And it's a uh, software error, and they're asking for the full amount to be abated. Okay. So in the amount of $55,000, it looks like. How many? $55,000. That's quite a software error. Yeah. <laughs> and that's why they're <laughs> requesting it. <laughs> Whoa, baby, that's a lot of water. <laughs> Actually, it looks like 122,317. <laughs> is that where the is that where the meter went in backwards? No, that was uh, 166 Russell Street. Yeah, this one's just the software it looks like. So, could I get a motion on this one? Sure. Uh, motion to approve the abatement. All right. Second. Any further discussion? All right, all those in favor. Aye. Hey, Aye. Susan didn't have something for us, or is Susan signaling to wait? Uh, she oh. is. She's oh. muted. So I'm Susan, you got on mute. <laughs> Sorry. On 166 Russell Street, I'm on the phone with Kim right now. Um, that was a request by Sharon to abate that. Yeah, it wasn't there. <laughs> The balance was six hundred and something dollars. Was the correct gallons that went through it backwards? Hey, so uh, it's twenty four thousand six hundred and eighty six dollars and twenty cents is what should be abated from the meter rolling backwards. Hang, hang on. Let's do one thing at a time here. We're on two hundred seven Russell Street. Let's do that one first. We didn't. Okay, finish. then we'll backtrack. Okay, I don't have a problem with two hundred seven Russell. All right. So I got a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Upstate. We will move on to 20, or 166 Russell Street. And Sue, go ahead with that one. Um, I'm on the phone with Kim right now. That was Sharon's request for an abatement because uh, the reading was done incorrectly by the water department. I guess. Yeah. I, I will make a motion to accept the abatement uh, for they their their pay will be uh, uh, six hundred and ten dollars. Is that correct? I don't have it in front of me, Joyce. I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I asking, think that, go ahead, Jen. They're asking the amount to be abated to be twenty four thousand eight hundred and sixty six dollars and twenty two cents. Can you mute it? Can you mute it? Correct. With the um, the amount being six hundred and ten dollars, is that not correct? I believe From the six hundred. I, I believe the six hundred and ten dollars is what they're going to pay, and we're going to abate the twenty four thousand eight hundred sixty six dollars and twenty two cents. Correct. So I'll make a motion. I'll make a motion to accept that. Thank you. Second. Discussion. Who knew this would be so hard? <laughs> All right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 And abstain. Okay. All right, now moving on. Uh, let's go with uh, snow removal proposal and culverts. And uh, Chris Okafer, DPW director, will discuss a proposal to manage snow and ice on town owned property, principally parking areas and access ways. Mr. Okafer will also give a summary of the latest inspection reports of culverts in town. Chris, let's do the culverts first, and then we'll talk about snow. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I um, 
if you recall, a few months ago, when I appeared before the board, I submitted the, a report concerning them, various coverts in town. And also, we also um, categorized them on the dangerousness. Now, we just got uh, a report from Mass DOT concerning their inspections. And uh, they're very concerned about um, the 47 River Drive, which is the Russell's, Russell V. Brook um, covert or the bridge. Um, now, it's on the state list for TIP program and it's been going back and forth. Also, the state is focusing on Route 9. And one of the recommendations concerning this location is the fact that some of the guardrails and uh, railings are not in good shape. And so safety is, um, they are concerned about safety because it's of the location. The report also um, are concerned about the, co the depth, the thickness of the cover. Uh, that is pushing the pressure for us to take a look at the cover in terms of repairs. But my reason for bring, bringing this up tonight is to uh, see if the board can authorize us to either use some chapter 90 money to do some guardrail repairs and some minor repairs in the area. Because the state is concerned that um, the, guard, the current guardrail, because of years, uh, it's been, it has failed and the post is not anchored. And so the location is uh, also part of residential location. So they are, they are admonishing us to do some minor repairs while we are still waiting for either the TIP program or for the town to have a, a future funding to repair that, uh, that bridge. We also have uh, other culverts that they did inspection on, on Mount Warner and the Mill River Bridge or culvert. It also needs some urgent attention also. In the case of that, that is a little bit different from the one from River Drive. That is part of uh, is part of the covert report I, I submitted to the board a few months ago. So I don't know if the board. I know that things are very difficult right now. We've also submitted a request for the MVP program, a grant. The state has not been able to meet their deadline because of uh, we don't know why, but. We are assuming it's COVID issues. Uh, recently, they told us at the beginning of August, we will hear if the town got any, anything. Uh, so far, they've moved it back to sometime before the end of the month. Uh, they also moved it back initially to middle of August. Talking to our consultants, uh, they're thinking anywhere from now to, middle, to the end of the month. Uh, so we don't know where that um, the state stand on that grant, but we think based on our findings and our report that the, if they are going to give any grant, the town should be able to get some money. But if the town doesn't get any money from that MVP grant, I am recommending to the board to allow us to use some money to um, from Chapter 90 funds to either look at how far we can go in terms of. Um, mitigating some of these problems um, on these uh, locations, especially 47. 47 is a busy road, and uh, both vehicular and pedestrians use that area. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. And how much is it going to be, roughly? I, if we, the, our consultants have not given us a number in terms of how much, but they think somewhere within, uh, anywhere between, Fifty to hundred thousand should be able to do some major, some repairs that would give basically buy time, uh, but they they are own part of that includes their consulting fees or uh, structural engineers uh, um, fees. So and then also a report. Um, it also includes the um, we also will be submitting the findings to the conservation. So that also includes their report to conservation. So is uh, is conservation moving on any of this stuff? Because I know with uh, 
example, for example, the culvert on nightly that has missing walls on the side of the road. Um, that's, you know, been like that for a year and a half. Now we're going to end up with a $150,000 John Deere in a ditch one of these days because of that. Or, uh, yes. Uh, the, the finally, um, the finally has, uh, has, uh, at least given us a, uh, what I call positive, um, positive, um, answer. Uh, I, about a week or two ago, I went, uh, I went back to conservation and then I also took some pictures. I also, um, Joyce, uh, J Janice was, um, also went on a ride with me. I was able to convince her to come. So now they have agreed that, um, uh, their September uh, month, we should present a request. So I plan to do that uh, before the end of uh, next week to her so that she will get it for their September meeting. Uh, I, I told her that it's an emergency request for nightly rain, nightly and also the head wall on East Street by Nebola's farm. Uh, so both two locations, I'll be putting a request to conservation uh, before the end of August for their September meeting so that they can uh, hopefully approve it ASAP. So can we um, can we get a better idea on cost? Can we narrow it down a little bit before we give you you know the authority to spend chapter ninety or something else on it so we know what we're spending? David, I don't know why we're using chapter ninety money on uh, Russell Brook because David Nixon, I believe the state took that whole project over, didn't they? Yeah, so that project is on the state uh, transportation improvement program um, list for um, nine hundred thousand uh, dollars we have some money for the engineering already set aside um, but that uh, that uh, project has really not moved on that uh, transportation list for several years and um, you know the, the, the thing continues to degrade um, and we keep on waiting for mass dot Well, if they took it over, we shouldn't spend any money on it. If they're going to take the responsibility for it, Route 47 is their road. It's a state road. They've taken, re they've, taken, they've taken responsibility for the upgrade of the culvert. They've not taken over either the, the culvert or the road. The road is a state-numbered road, but it is functionally a town road. So if we can kind of get a better idea of what our exact costs are going to be, maybe spend a little bit of money for on, on the engineering so we know what we're going to have to spend, and then we'll figure out where we're going to pull that money out of. Mr. So Chairman, I should be able to get this information to the board before the next board meeting. Do you mind if we, if we table this for the next board meeting so I can get all the information you requested? Yep, that's fine. Thanks. So, and then uh, let's talk about snow real quick. Yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much one more time for, I, I'm coming before the board because uh, we, we are um, approaching this period where DPWs are um, thinking ahead, uh, especially in New England. We've been very blessed, especially in last winter. We, we were able to, uh, consider, considering other, part, other years, we met all the requirements, but um, I'm coming for the board because I'm planning and begin to prepare for my snow season. And there are a couple of things since I've, I've been in Hadley, uh, based on my observation and also based on the manpower we have, I, I'm coming before the board to request for the board to take a look at our snow operations. I submitted three options to the board in my letter to the chair. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we, because it's New England, we, the DPW here, we don't have plan, what I call plan B in terms of snow fighting. We are very grateful to the staff of DPW. Our guys are very hardworking. Uh, whatever it takes, we meet the challenges. But at the same time, the, it's my job as a director to have a plan B if I need to use plan B or even to have a plan C. What do I mean by that, Mr. Chairman? For example, I have, I don't have enough manpower 
if I have a major uh, emergency snowstorm, as we had a couple of years back, I will not be able to meet the standard that the board expects us to meet. Uh, I've also, me as an, as an individual, my standard is very high, and uh, the the staff of DPW standard is also very high. We try to meet all the requirements. And the more we look at the group of work and the area we have to cover, we're having more areas to cover right now. We have the new fire station, we have Council on Aging, we have other areas, we have the roads. But we the frequency of the storm is the is not something we can control. And also, it's not at a time of emergency that I will need to come before the board to request for uh, um, things that I, I need to bring before the board right now. That's why I'm asking the board to authorize us or to give us some authorization. I listed three options and many, many communities tend to follow the combination of one or two of those options. Uh, in the case of Hadley, Mr. Chairman, if this, the school option is, is uh, it will not cost the town anything in the sense that we have custodial staffs in the school system and they're already on the payroll. Uh, the PW would like to have them in the case of snow emergency. Now, I may not need them in every snowstorm, but if I need to, um, I need extra hands or extra equipment, I would like the board to either meet with the school committee or find a mechanism whereby. Uh, we have the uh, opportunity to use as many custodial staff. In the case of Hadley, they don't have to have CDL, but at least uh, they are be able to drive our pick our pickup trucks, our dump trucks. Even if it means that we have to assign them to schools and and probably town buildings, it, or we have to use them to replace uh, guys while they may take our uh, guys may take breaks or in case of illness, I'll be able to have uh, manpower to do the job. Uh, that is one option. The other option, which uh, is very, um, many communities use that option, but we don't need to use it all the time. But if we have to use it, it's, a very, it's one of the best options. It's where we have a contract with uh, a vendor or a contractor. Uh, um, a signed contract whereby if we need um, to extra trucks or manpower, we are at two o'clock at night, we are not able to, the, the, we can easily call on the contractor. And the rate has been set long before winter months. And then we all, oh, and this is not done in every storm. It's, it depends on how the duration of the storm and how uh, rough the storm is. Sometimes we may need uh, we may not need a truck. We may just need a, a bigger bigger equipment to haul or to do other things. Uh, the other third option that I I recommend to the board, but I think that uh, is the is the third option. But I pref I I do not prefer that option. But I said the board prefers the option, and I will explain why I don't prefer the third option. The third option is where we have a list of drivers or individuals in town who we will have their names. It may even be town employees. We have their names as paid and then we call them as per needed. Sometimes uh, that is always not reliable because there is nothing that requires them to respond. Plus, because of uh, liabilities, insurance and others, we've, it's also another problem for us, especially the issue of not being reliable. So I'm coming before the board for the board to look at how the board can assist us in terms of uh, our preparation for the snowstorm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. John, comment on that, anybody? I'd like to take it under advisement. I was going to ask how many school employees are there that could possibly do this? And 
is that a tricky path to navigate because of, I don't know <laughs> if custodial employees are under a union or different things at the school. I just don't know enough about that um, group that's employed at the school. They're not unionized yet, Christian. In the, okay. In the past, the past big storms we've had, we've uh, used the custodians from the schools. We used some of the fire department personnel. Some of the volunteer fire department personnel do have hydraulic licenses, truck driving licenses, and they're all, most of the citizens in town, they're laid off from construction in the wintertime. And some of them are more than happy to help us, you know, during a big storm, not, not every storm every day. And we've done it in the past that way. How many employees have we lost that we haven't replaced labor-wise? That's my other question. Two or three laborers. We're, ha we're hiring plenty of supervisors, but we have no laborers. How many are we missing? That's the going thing these days, John. Every institution hires middle and upper management, but nothing down the bottom. So maybe we need to take a look at that. That's what I'm trying to say. All right. Um, Mr. Chairman, in terms of uh, public works, uh, we don't have too, uh, too many managers, in my view, compared to the scope of work we do. Uh, we all the managers, including myself, the field superintendent, and the foreman, we are very busy. Uh, I do understand the town, uh, the perception that we have, we have um, managers, but in the public works arena, we don't have uh, we don't have uh, uh, managers who are just sitting in the office or who are not doing um, actively working. Yes. Are they going to are they going to be out plowing too? That's my question. The the I I I, I run the snow. I do uh, the we don't plow, but we tend to open the road. For example, I if we have an emergency where our individual staff is not available, I can plow, and Scott can plow. Mm -hmm. but, so, but uh, the. The other employees, all of them, including the foreman, has plan routes. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. The issue of co co custodial staff, Mr. Chairman, even while we are out there, the custodial staff currently, they don't show up till at probably five or six in the morning. Sometimes they even uh, disturb all the things we've done. Uh, John, John can attest to that. But the reason why I, I, I brought that as an option is because, we, to my knowledge, they have up to four or five custodial staff, I'm told. Now, we may not need the whole five of them. And secondly, it's not at every storm. Many storms we can handle. The thing is, as DPW, we need to have uh, plan B. Now, John made a statement right now that, that uh, retired people, the fire guys, the different guys, they, they, uh, they live in town, they can help us. Mr. Chairman, that is too simplistic. That is too simplistic in 2020. We don't have any, I don't have any, a list of any fire guy I can call tomorrow to say, hey, John, or Moses, or uh, we need you. I don't have a list. I don't have a mechanism. There was nothing in place before I came, when I came on board. And that is why I'm coming to my employers to request for this too. So if John knew that, he could have, he, he's a select man, he works with DPW. He could have approached us or approached me since we've been here. There is nobody, even John himself, we, he knows. We, he, they are the wastewater guys. He has to take care of wastewater. Many times we put him on the road also, including other uh, staff. We, we don't have a situation where um, retired fire guys or anybody. It's possible that they may. That is my option three. Option three is where we have a, a list of work, uh, individuals. Who can call upon but the thing is it's not reliable in my experience some of them may come one once or twice and and that is not good enough for me and for the select board so that is why i am I'm a, i came before the board to seek a better approach it's possible that the board may approve that we should 
put out there people who may want to apply for us and different criteria they may they have to meet or the board may decide based on my options that none of the options is feasible but i think i owe it to the board to bring my case to the board okay all right well, let's 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 take this under advisement and uh bring it back uh the first part of september and uh, i'd like to see the whole plan uh written out so i can have a a visual of what I can see, uh, what we might have to do, and then take a vote. Then that that would be my recommendation. And then uh, I know in the past we've had call lists for guys we've called in. So let's see if we can uh, reestablish a, a call list of people that in a big storm we could call in to run a truck for a few hours. And yeah. So I'm so hearing I'm hearing the DPW director say that in really big storms is when he might call in the custodial staff. And it seems to me that in really big staff, they would even be available since school will be closed. And mm -hmm. that makes a lot of sense to me. Exactly. Yeah, that's true, but, but I, I, don't, I, I think uh, the board might need to authorize that or maybe speak with the school committee. I don't know the logistics. Maybe. Well, uh, you know, we, we have no control over the school employees, number one. So we would have to have some uh, reciprocity with the school committee or with the school department on how we would be able to uh, use their personnel. So that's something that we need to look into further. So that's not, like I said, this isn't a vote for tonight. This is something that we need to look into uh, and see what our options are, see how the school department will respond to uh, this request and then go from there. All right, so let's, let's think. How many, how many laborer positions are open right now in DPW? Two, three? We, we have two, and at the end of the year, it will be three. Because we have Mr. Uh, James, uh, the, the board has placed James on the, on the trial basis for six months. So there's three employees right now loud. that you could hire without a problem. Three laborers, bring them in and start training them right now. You got three more drivers right there. I, I will I will I will I will go with that. But that's required the board to, to make that call. And I do appreciate the board taking my request and advise me. All right. So we'll we'll come back to this in September. Uh let's see if we can make that call list, put put that out there, get a call list together, and also let's work on the, the custodial staff to see if the school committee is interested in doing that as well. Also, David, can we take a look at the uh, DPW uh, employment and see what positions are open and what might work if we need to fill any uh, and, and if it would be more cost effective to bring somebody on board uh, if there's three openings one or two uh, and see how that would go so let's also look at that before September sounds good all right thanks Chris thank you Mr. Chairman I'm very grateful all right thank you thank you all right, so we'll move on into my favorite subject of all. No, what's that? COVID-19 update. Oh, mine too. I live it. <laughs> the select board will review the town of Hadley's response and plans for dealing with COVID-19. The select board will also review the Board of Health policy regarding masks that was adopted on August 13th, 2020. Oh. And uh, if you are not familiar, the uh, Board of Health made a order that requires 100% uh, mask wearing, uh, even if socially distanced outside with nobody around on the Route 9, and I guess that would be North Maple, and uh, I guess a little bit of University Drive, somewhere over there, uh, affected on the 17th of August, and anyone violating that is subject to possible fines. And this is above and beyond what the governor's orders require. Um, I've got some, some concerns. One of the concerns I had was I, I had asked them to remove the part of the order that says that they may call on the police department to be the enforcers of this local order. Um, in, in my opinion, uh, police fire and inspections should not be devoting anything whatsoever to enforcing this sort of order above and beyond what the governor is requiring. Police, fire, and inspections are busy enough, and especially the police department has enough to enough issues to deal with in this day and age as it is, rather than being the mask police. 
So and I stuff. and I have said from day one also, I think I've been pretty explicit about that, that that's not under the purview of our police department. We're at a stretch now. Our fire department is um, just able to run as it does run. And our building inspector has enough on his plate that he doesn't need to be monitoring uh, face masks also. I think it's great to have something in place. I am in all favor of people wearing their masks as they should uh, within six feet of people. I think that is the governor's uh, uh, law uh, in making sure that everybody stays safe between people and in large groups. 25, I think we're down now to tw back to 25 or 50, per 50 people in a group. Um, so I, I, you know, I think we have other things that we need to look at without going around and trying to find other things. I don't think that we have authority on the bike path. I think that that was dropped. Uh, if you're running or biking, you don't need to wear a face mask. Um, you know, there. I'm not even sure that it's our purview on, on the bike path to monitor this. Um, it's under DCR, so I, I don't think that's under our jurisdiction. So there are a few couple of discrepancies that um, need to be ironed out at this point. So what I'd like to see is that uh, we make a, a resolution that um, police, fire, and inspections resources will only be used to enforce the governor's order as required by the, the state order, not local ordinances, because I, I don't want people calling 911 to report somebody by themselves without a mask on in the Home Depot parking lot. Um, it just, it doesn't make any sense. There, there's no rhyme or reason to it. So, um, I, I, would would, I, I think I just feel like we might be taking this a little too far. I just feel like it does say the designated enforcing authority may call on the support of the Hadley police department if necessary. I don't think see anything about fire or building inspections in here. And it's just saying may call on the support of the Hadley Police Department if necessary. It's not saying anything about the Hadley Police Department having to enforce this or anything. So, Right, but I don't want them to have the ability to call on the police or the fire department or any other employee for that matter outside of the Board of Health's uh, individual responsibility or purview to enforce this local order. Yeah, that our thing. resources are thin enough right now. Police, fire, inspections... DPW, as you just heard, uh, you know, there's only so much we can do, and and I think the state, the state recommendations are the things to go by right now. The numbers have been down in the state. The governor's doing a great job right now, as far as I'm concerned, with the masks and the ordinances and everything else. Some people do go out of control. I mean, that's that's nothing we can we can do about that. I think I think you avoid them. That's what you do. Yeah. Um, I'll second your motion, David. All right. So yeah, I'll make that motion and second. Any further discussion on this? Uh, Chief, do you want to say anything before we uh, throw you in the bus? <laughs> no, sorry. My uh, my screen was freezing there. Um, I don't. Uh, I don't, without making any comments on the, the actual order itself, that's, that's under the purview of the board. Um, my concern is just what's, what's going to happen as far as the workload we're going to, we're going to see increasing because of this. Um, you know, Hadley's a, a town of 5,500 people with 50,000 people driving in that area that is designated right now. Those are people that aren't going to know the rule. They're not going to know the put in place and, and we're going to be we're going to be getting calls about those folks um that's that's my biggest concern we we worked with um with dick when he was on the board of health um he requested our assistance when all of this started and at that point it made a lot of sense because no one knew what the rules were no one knew how we were going to it none of the businesses had any idea how to handle these things and in all reality even with just that there required some legal documentation of Dick allowing us to, to, to have that enforcement authority. Um, this is going to kind of change the ball game. And uh, I'm a little worried about the kind of the amount of calls we're going to get 
uh, because of this. I'm not going to comment at all on the strictness of the order. We will do what, uh, what the board wants us to do. You have had uh, minimal amount of calls for masks and, and other issues with COVID. Yeah. Minimal, minimal. Yeah. We've had a minimal amount of calls. Um, it, it really hasn't been too, too bad, but you know, that's, that's kind of dropped off when this first started. Uh, we were getting, you know, calls about this because most of the people didn't know what the rules were. Um, it's gotten better as people learn the rules. And this is that, this is my concern is that now, now the rule, the game is changing again. Um, so we're going to, I'm just afraid we're going to start getting them again. Um, and, uh, you know, as David mentioned, the, the way that the way that the, the new order is written right now, uh, his description of that person standing in the parking lot of Home Depot by themselves is in violation. Um, happy to help where we can. Like I said, we, we work at uh, the, the select board, our police commissioners. You can give us our marching orders and we will do uh, whatever that you ask. Um, but, you know, I don't know if the fire chief wants to weigh in as the EMD, uh, um, even though they're not technically, wouldn't technically be named as enforcing authority. He does have some authority in that area, but that's just my feelings. I think one of the things that's about to happen or is happening is the influx of the students returning. Even though the university is not opening the campus, that's going to make more people um, dissipate because they are going to keep crowds down. And if you can't gather in Amherst, guess where you go? And I know that's going to make more calls on you anyway. And I think if it starts to be really difficult in terms of enforcing a very strict bylaw that people have no idea, that's, that's just not reasonable. Well, well we, that, we, that's we, kind of my concern is that right now, all of those students that are going to come back understand that if they stay this far apart, six feet, they're good. They don't have to wear a mask. Uh, they're outside and, and we're changing on them. So we are going, it, it's inevitable. We're going to get more calls because they're going to have no clue when someone brings this up to them that you can be 30 feet apart and still be in violation if you're group nine somewhere. And Amy had I, I, was but I, think, I think we already have rules in place about um, large gatherings. And I think that comes under the police purview. Um, I just want to remind the police to make sure that all of our police officers are masked and doing safe things when they uh, go to these large gatherings, that they stay safe themselves, um, because we are going to have that. There are students that are returning, even though UMass says they are not having students on campus. There are students that are returning to this area that have already rented houses that are going to be in this area. Um, so I think we all need to be still aware uh, of the influx. They might not be on campus, but they're going to be off of campus. And so we still need to be aware of it. We still need to do our due diligence um, in reminding people to wear masks, no matter where they are, what they do, going into stores, and please wash your hands. Um, th those are the main things. If you have ever known anybody, and I have that it has, has had COVID, it's not a good thing. So please do your due diligence and do what you need to do. Amy had something mm -hmm. waving her hand. Hey, thanks. I just wanted to just mention one other thing that some people don't think of. Um, working on Route 9, and this is, should be affecting all of Route 9. Um, I work inside all day with a mask on, taking care of our customers and employees. Um, the employees, myself, we need a mask break once in a while. We go outside and we get a mask break. How about all the other employees that are working on Route 9 that once in a while will need a mask break um, just to get some fresh air? And I just think it's very unfair to take all of Route 9 and, and put it that, like that. We're not like Amherst where we have a, 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 um, a sidewalk where everybody is going up and down. Northampton or Amherst, we, we are big, we, you know, we have some stores and we have employees that, that need a break once in a while. And I think it's um, unfair of the health, health department to do this. Well, it's unfair to your employees. 
I, I truly believe that, yes, you do need a mask break and that you need to get outside for fresh air. You can't wear a mask for eight hours a day. That's unrealistic. So um, everybody needs to do their due diligence when going outside and being away from people, but making sure that they do get their mask breaks. That's important. All right. Any further discussion? I just have one last or one last comment is one. I feel like we should bring these concerns to the board of health mass breaks in particular. And if we vote in favor of this motion, I don't think that stops people from calling uh, to report, you know, mask infractions. I think we're still going to have those calls. And does that put the police department in a real dilemma of, somebody's calling 911, do you respond to that complaint? Or do you say, oh, no, we don't have to respond to mask related infractions. It just creates a lot of confusion. And I prefer just what? a conversation and unified command to work this me, out rather than try to have conflicting resolutions. Let me tell you, people better not be calling 911 for mask infractions. That's a misuse of our emergency system. So people better start to think about when they dial the 911. That is not for frivolous times when you might be seeing somebody without a mask that's 30 feet away from you, but they're outside by themselves. That is not something that you would call 911 for. So please do not misuse that 911 call. So, so I, I, I agree with you. I, I agree with you 100%, but the calls may come in, but I think Christian does have a point that uh, you are. Yeah. What Amy just brought up is is really kind of important. Um, you know, as far as these mask breaks go, you got all these big businesses, and I think maybe having a discussion like that. I mean, Board of Health, I think, has the authority to do this. But I think some of these concerns. Come here, um, two, two guys doing all the Mr. Chairman inspections in that. Mr. But um, Who's in on the voice here? This is Mike, Mike, the uh, emergency management director, fire chief. Oh, hi, Mike. Oh, hi, <laughs> Mr. Chair. Um, <laughs> uh, I just wanted to state that uh, it might be a good idea for us to reconvene Unified Command. I know that Dr. Mosler was willing uh, to amend some of the, uh, the order that was put in place, and we should probably bring this back to her. Uh, in regards to this, so maybe we can amend this again uh, for the mass break issue, and then just uh, just make sure that uh, all this is is very clearly identified um, again. And I think you know, M Chief Mason, um, we, we we've gone above and beyond with ensuring that all the police cruisers and the police staff understand that they are there to support uh, public health if necessary. So we have mass and all the cruisers, uh, you know, if if they are called out for a specific reason. But again, I completely agree with Chief Mason that we can't handle any additional calls to, you know, to folks that are complaining about somebody standing out in the middle of Home Depot without a mask on. So again, maybe we need to uh, reconvene Unified Command and add these uh, amendments to this uh, this order if possible. Right. Yeah. And the only reason that I brought this up was because I uh, had asked them when the draft was circulated to take out the language about calling on the police department for this. And that wasn't removed. Instead, they, they passed it. And unfortunately, they, they don't um, have any purview over the police department. That's the select board. And so that's why this is an issue for us. But I, I, I agree with the chief. Uh, let's, you know, maybe we need to make some modifications to that uh, mask order, but that's up to the Board of Health to do, not, not us. Um, so I'm, I'm really just concerned about uh, the employees for which we have purview. So if there's no further discussion, um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 I guess I'm abstaining. <laughs> okay. All right. Good enough. Uh, well, so. I mean, we're we're still abiding by the state law. I mean, the state mandates. You know, he, Governor Baker is updating us every day. I watch him for a couple minutes at lunchtime. Uh, what's happening and what's changing? And uh, like I said, he's doing a great job trying to keep the state within check here. So I don't see, you know, why 
why we need to go over and above over and above what the state's mandating, you know. All right, so moving on to uh, town hall reopening for early voting. Um, town hall clerk needs to allow people to vote in person for early voting for both the primary September 1st and general election November 3rd. Early voting occurs in town hall. Primary and general elections occur at the new senior center. Early voting for the primary takes place Saturday, August 22nd through Friday, August 28th. Early voting for the general election takes place Saturday, October 17th through Friday, October 30th. Select board will review and take action on the town hall and senior center reopening plan that features a phased return to work. The phases are based on the data about the pandemic. So David Nixon, take it away. Okay, so we're gonna, uh, town hall will be open uh, starting this Saturday uh, for early voting. We don't expect a lot of uh, foot traffic. Uh, because a lot of people are taking advantage of the uh, um, ballots by mail. Uh, the numbers uh, apparently are quite high for ballots for mail, by mail, and uh, so we expect some foot traffic, but not a whole lot. Chief uh, Spanknickel is working on a uh, plan, which uh, is gonna be developed and finished by the end of this week for making sure that people enter the building, uh, pass through, uh, are registered so that we can do contract, uh, contact tracing if necessary, uh, able to vote and then exit the building uh, by another doorway so that we have one-way traffic. Uh, proper protocols in place. Uh, offices are closed to the public so somebody can't come in and vote and pay a tax bill at the same time. Uh, the idea is get people in, give them their op their right to vote, and get them out so that they are safe and the town staff are safe. Once that's done, uh, we have, we should start thinking about reopening town hall. So the proposed plan here is to gradually reopen with various precautions in place, try to tie this to the governor's uh, reopening plan mm -hmm. for the Commonwealth as much as possible. Um, make sure that we're evaluating um, how our performance is uh, and making sure that we follow the protocols for the social distancing, wearing masks, hand sanitizing, uh, and other uh, pre preventive measures. Um, and at some point, we will return to a new normal, uh, which is probably going to be very different from the old normal. Um, but uh, we have a plan in place. If you could take a vote on this plan, that would be very helpful. All right. And uh, this has been circulated to all town hall employees, correct, for comment and feedback? That's right. They gave me a lot of feedback and I've tried to incorporate it as much of it as I possibly could. Some of the feedback was uh, contradictory. So there are some people who are going to say, but wait, you didn't include my, my proposal. Well, that's because I couldn't fit it into the, into the framework. Uh, but I think this is a good plan. Um, we certainly can evaluate the plan as we go along. If we run into uh, practical problems. We certainly bring that back to the board and we will take whatever necessary steps we need to in order to ensure that um, we perform our work, but we do it in a safe manner and effective manner. And we have several town hall and Susan's waving her hand. So Susan, go ahead if you have any comment. Yeah, I was just curious, um, is there a reason at this time that we can't um, uh, do meeting with people by appointment so that you don't have people coming in willy-nilly, but you have an appointment with them. And I'm particularly concerned for some of our elders. Um, they're, they have issues paying online. They don't wanna leave their tax bills in the Dropbox and they don't want to mail them. They want a stamped receipt. 
can can we implement something along those lines that I, I know you have that in a future portion of the plan, but could we implement that sooner rather than later? I think that in order to implement that, we need to have uh, better uh, mask wearing in town hall. We have too many people who are not wearing masks. Uh, and I don't want to bring the public in uh, while we uh, are not uh, following the basics for keeping ourselves and our, our clients safe. Okay. Uh, is there a reason that we can't put out there that um, people can come to, by appointment to the back porch and I'll go out and see them? I don't have a problem with that. I, okay. I think the issue is going to be during this early voting time. Um, we were trying to avoid the, you know, taxpayers coming in to take care of business, running into the people early doing early voting. So I think as soon as early voting is over with, we can certainly do a, an appointment system, but I just don't know if we can handle both at the same time. That'd be great. Or I could meet with people on the front porch yeah. versus the back porch. <laughs> I just have a question. Um, one is, and unfortunately, I saw the plan in Monday night when I reviewed everything, but it's gone today. So I don't know what happened to the, the board docs if it got edited and deleted. Um, I might be able to pull it up on my computer. But how does it how does it relate to the governor's stages, I guess, because I know you had like an alphabetical opening, I believe, versus the governor's being numbered. Right. So the governor has a four or five uh, stage um, plan for reopening the, the, the Commonwealth. He's numbered them one through five. Um, and I uh, have put together a similar phased approach, but just to avoid confusion as to whether we're talking about Hadley or the Commonwealth, I've numbered them. Uh, I've lettered them A through E, I think it is. Um, and they follow very closely to with each other that, you know, stage stage one for the governor, for stage two for the governor is a very tight lo lockdown uh, with very minimal activity. That would correspond with our stage A. And then stage five, um, of the governor's plan is we've returned to normal business as usual. Um, that would correspond with our phase E, where we've opened up town hall with no restrictions. So is there any way to set up Susan on the front porch, like for September's uh, tax bills that would come in? Um, the water bills, I think, are due September 1st, correct? Yes, they are. So is there some way at one end uh, where there wouldn't be any heavy traffic that we could uh, stipulate six feet apart, just like they do, like we do in my office? You have it um, spaced apart so that people are able to come in and uh, or able to go to the porch during the day if that's convenient uh, to pay their bills in some instance like that with their mask on. And, and I do that all the time, Joyce. Yep. I, I've been doing it. that. I think, um, you know, because people are talking about not doing it inside town hall uh, while in the process of doing this uh, primary election type of thing, but maybe we could do something outside. And I, th I think that's doable. The majority of our taxpayers and love them to death because the majority of them have already sent in their water bills. But um, yeah, it's it, my primary concern is for our seniors who um, they don't have either they don't have computers for a way to navigate online. 
I've been going to people's homes and and collecting, uh, you know, collecting their bills and giving them a stamped receipt. And they're very happy about that yeah. um, because it, it's a it's just a very different world right now. Yeah. Um, so thank I, you for thank you for doing that. Yeah, I mean, it, it's the right thing to do. But thank you for supporting the seniors. And, and I do. I, I mean, they support us. <laughs> so, but, um, you know, it comes down to at, at some point we've, we've got to have interaction. And I understand, David, your concern about during early voting, because I'm concerned about that too. My expectation is that people will vote and come into my office and say, oh, by the way, what else do I owe? Or, you know, and that's fine normally. It's a little weird now, you know? So um, I just, uh, I think by appointment only would work very well. So. That's it. What are the early voting hours? Does it start at 9 a.m. or is it uh, not until noon? Uh, Saturday. Saturday is from 2 to 4. Sunday is from 10 to 12. And Monday through Friday are regular business hours, 9 to 4. Thank you. Yeah, I was just wondering if it was noon to five and you could have appointments from nine to 11 or something like that, you know? It's during the week, it's uh, regular business hours. Okay. Water bills are due uh, September 1st. When's the next tax bill due? Is that October 1st or? November 1st, November 1st. or November 2nd. Okay. So then, and when does early voting end? November, I believe it's October 30th. All right. So then maybe you want to, I don't know, I, I guess we could make some appointments on the day those tax bills are due for people that really need to do that. And then we can avoid the conflict in between. And then after we, we're done with this early voting, we can go forward with appointments going forward if that's what you want to do for the collector, collector's office. That makes sense. Is that okay with everybody else? Yeah. And the appointments would just be in the front hallway or on the front porch or on the back porch? Where would you want to just say? If you have early voting, I think the way they've designed it is coming in through the back door and going out through the front door. Um, I don't have a, a problem meeting people on the front porch. I don't mind going to people's cars. <laughs> I mean, you know. Let's unless unless they're handicap accessible and they have to use the ramp. I just ask: Is are we talking about for this uh, primary? Are you talking about setting this up for this primary? Yes. I was talking about after the primary. No, November, Mike. Okay. And yeah, November. the the plan will the actual flow plan will be out this week, and it's one entry in, and it's going to be the handicapped entrance on the. Uh, the southeast side of the building. Mm. And okay. there'll be a firefighter that's uh, checking to confirm that they're coming in to vote. If we have a handicapped person that needs to access that way, then all voting will, it, it will be a single person in, in the space. And then we'll get them back out that same door. Super. Okay. So appointments starting, appointments on November 1st. No appointments in that works. All right, everybody. Thank you. Everybody else good with the uh, reopening plan? Any other questions? Yeah. Or Sounds good. Right. Do you need anything else from us on that? If you could take a vote, that'd be great. All right. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? Those in favor? Aye. Oh. Aye. Hi. Hi. All right. Uh, let's move on to library, fire station, and senior center updates. Jane, do you want to go first with the senior center? Yes, I, I talked to the um, manager on the library site, and they're planning on 
having everything paved and ready on um, August 31st so that it will be open for voting. Should they miss that schedule, they will not be working on the first so that they will not interfere with voting. And voting will be in the planned two, one directional way. And uh, how about the library? Christian, what do you have for the library? Uh, not too much. It's moving along. Uh, seems like it's coming together. You know, they're putting in curbing and paving. Jane knows more about their paving schedule than I do. So um, all I know is it's coming along pretty well. Uh, I, but I don't know exactly what the completion date is right now. They're actually looking at early to mid-September for finishing the work. The library is not quite ready to move in, but most of the work will be done. They're moving uh, carpeting in tomorrow and putting up ceiling tiles. And, and Joyce for this uh, fire station or the fire chief wants to talk about it. Yeah, um, Mike sent me my little cue tonight, which was nice of him. So uh, still completing the punch list and working on furniture and other items. And we should be getting started on the fiber portion soon. And we are working on plan to get items out of the North Hall fire station as well. That's that. And uh, David Nixon, do you want to hit anything on your administrator's report before we wrap up? Uh, let's see. We covered a lot of the, the ground. Let me change glasses so I can actually see my own writing. Um, I'll ask for Joyce. Any word on the North Hadley Hall? Well, yeah. 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 So we've been in contact with the uh, buyer, uh, the real estate agent. Uh, we're uh, tightening up the preservation restriction on the exterior, and we're going to move forward with the, that sale as soon as possible. I talked about uh, the sale at the most recent uh, department head meeting and asked that, uh, that uh, people start removing the gear from that uh, building. I think uh, Chief Spanknable alluded to that. I think you're going to be doing some sales of surplus equipment. Park and Rec will also be uh, removing their, their gear as well. I think we have covered covered everything so far. All right. So any uh, announcements before we wrap up? Yeah, could, could I just have some informational information? I've been asked if there's any um, projects that are being built on Rocky Hill Road that you're aware of. Anybody? Is that over near Sylvia Lane? Uh, yes, in that area. Where all the trees have been cut down? Yes. I've received a bunch of phone calls about that today. I referred that to our Conservation Commission uh, Chair and Janice Stone and asked them to get back to the residents, but I don't have any other information about it. But we don't have any projects going in there that you know of. No. Not okay. that I know of. Okay, and then the other thing was, is do you have uh, any information tonight, uh, Jen, on the uh, chicken to go for the Legion? I believe that uh, Slick Board Chair Phil has some information about it. Well, oh my goodness, sakes alive! You're the you're the uh, you're the you're the licensing person. I okay, then I'll I'll do it. <laughs> um, <laughs> With Board of Health, uh, Building Inspector, and the Fire Chief, we were able to work together with the American Legion. And the Chicken to Go at the American Legion will be on for September 20th. They're going to, believe, start selling tickets pretty soon. I hear that uh, David Phil will be helping with that. Um, so call him with all your Chicken to Go needs. And um, they will be following proper COVID-19 procedures They'll have PPE um, and they'll be following all the COVID guidelines set forth by the Commonwealth and the Board of Health. So everybody buy your tickets for the chicken to go. I usually take six, so I expect them from somebody. 
So that'll be that'll have a, a seating or a, not a seating this time. Oh. Pick up, a pickup of uh, noon and 4 p.m. on the 20th. And um, I know that, you know, this is important to them. And the Young Men's Club is also planning on trying to do something in October. Yeah, that's good. This is this is the uh, Legion's twentieth year mm -hmm. in doing Chicken to Go, so it was really important to them to uh, make that milestone this year. So um, thank you to everybody that made that happen for them. Appreciate it. And yeah. the price of tickets? Yeah. Usually ten ten dollars, isn't it? Yeah, they haven't printed the tickets yet, but uh, it, it it is important for them since they've been shut down basically since March uh, yeah. due to COVID. So. Yeah. Any other announcements? Yeah, I do. Unfortunately, I do have a few um, um, passings uh, within the past month. Uh, we have Linda Rex, who is Ray Rex's mom. So condolences to him and his family. Uh, we have Nancy Morowski, who is also a lifelong resident of Hadley, who raised her children here and who they all went to Hopkins Academy, as she did. Her maiden name was Adams. Um, Margaret Freeman, who was the uh, elementary school secretary when my children went to school there, and uh, she was a longtime member of our historical uh, commission. So uh, condolences to Jim and her family also. And then Gary Berg's mom, Orrin Berg, has also passed. So condolences to Gary in his family. And we also had Irene Zima. You having a heart attack, John, or what? You're having a little heavy breathing there. Um, Irene Zima, um, uh, to her family also, we send her condolences. So that's my list for this month. Thank you. All right. If there's nothing else, um, well, the boss was sitting, I would have had the remote, and the boss wanted it. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> I wondered what that was. <laughs> Gonna have to drop my cell phone and run to your house to survive you. <laughs> so I wonder what our new administrator thinks of this behavior. <laughs> Just wait, Carolyn. It's only started. <laughs> I already feel at home. <laughs> no. right. Everybody just be safe. Continue to do what you're doing and uh, we'll all be at the next meeting, I hope. Can I get a motion to adjourn, please? So moved. Second. All those in favor. Oh, hold on. So all executive se sessions are canceled? Correct. We don't we don't need one for the contract. That's the only one. Sorry. Have, right? Uh, yep, just the town administrator, and we've taken care of that, so we're good. Thank you. All right, all those in favor of adjourning? Aye. 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 Good night, Aye. everybody. Good night. Have a great Aye. weekend, everybody. Enjoy. Aye. Thank you. Have a good night.